The Second Battle of El Alamein, the 23rd of October to the 11th of November 1942, was a battle of the Second World War that took place near the Egyptian railway halt of El Alamein. The First Battle of El Alamein and the Battle of Alam El Hafa had prevented the Axis from advancing further into Egypt. In August 1942, General Claude Auchinleck had been sacked as Commander-in-Chief Middle East Command and his successor, Lieutenant General William Gott was killed on his way to replace him as Commander of the Eighth Army. Lieutenant General Bernard Montgomery was appointed and led the Eighth Army offensive. The Allied victory was the beginning of the end of the Western Desert Campaign, eliminating the Axis threat to Egypt, the Suez Canal and the Middle Eastern and Persian oil fields. The battle revived the morale of the Allies, being the first big success against the Axis since Operation Crusader in late 1941. The battle coincided with the Allied invasion of French North Africa in Operation Torch on 8 November, the Battle of Stalingrad and the Guadalcanal Campaign. <laughs> <laughs> Background Panzer Army Africa, Panzer Arme Africa, Armata Karazata Africa, General Feldmarschall Erwin Rommel, composed of German and Italian tank and infantry units, had advanced into Egypt after its success at the Battle of Gazala, the 26th of May to the 21st of June 1942. The Axis advance menaced British control of the Suez Canal, the Middle East, and its oil resources. General Claude Auchinleck withdrew the 8th Army to within 80 km 50 miles of Alexandria where the Katara Depression was 64 km 40 miles south of El Alamein on the coast. The depression was impassable and meant that any attack had to be frontal and Axis attacks in the First Battle of El Alamein 1 July were defeated. Eighth Army counter-attacks in July also failed, as the Axis forces dug in and regrouped. Auchinleck called off the attacks at the end of July to rebuild the army. In early August, the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill and General Sir Alan Brooke, the Chief of the Imperial General Staff SIGS, visited Cairo and replaced Auchinleck as Commander-in-Chief Middle East Command with General Harold Alexander. Lieutenant General William Gott was made Commander of the Eighth Army but was killed when his transport aircraft was shot down by Luftwaffe fighters. Lieutenant General Bernard Montgomery was flown from Britain to replace him. Lacking reinforcements and depending on small, underdeveloped ports for supplies, aware of a huge Allied reinforcement operation for the Eighth Army, Rommel decided to attack first. The two armoured divisions of the Africa Corps and the reconnaissance units of Panzerarme Africa led the attack but were repulsed at the Alam El Hafa Ridge and Point 102 on 30 August 1942 during the Battle of Alam El Hafa and the Axis forces retired to their start lines. The short front line and secure flanks favoured the Axis defence and Rommel had time to develop the Axis defences, sowing extensive minefields with c. 500,000 mines and miles of barbed wire. Alexander and Montgomery intended to establish a superiority of force sufficient to achieve a breakthrough and exploit it to destroy Panzerarme Africa. Earlier in the Western Desert Campaign, neither side had been able to exploit a local victory sufficiently to defeat its opponent before it had withdrawn and transferred the problem of overextended supply lines to the victor. The British had an intelligence advantage because ultra and local sources exposed the Axis order of battle, its supply position and intentions. A reorganization of military intelligence in Africa in July had also improved the integration of information received from all sources and the speed of its dissemination. With rare exceptions, intelligence identified the supply ships destined for North Africa, their location or routing and in most cases their cargoes, allowing them to be attacked. By 25 October, Panzerarme Africa was down to three days' supply of fuel, only two days' worth of which were east of Tobruk. Harry Hinsley, the official historian of British intelligence wrote in 1981 that, "...the Panzer Army 
did not possess the operational freedom of movement that was absolutely essential in consideration of the fact that the British offensive can be expected to start any day." Submarine and air transport somewhat eased the shortage of ammunition and by late October, there was 16 days supply at the front. After six more weeks, the Eighth Army was ready, 195,000 men and 1,029 tanks began the offensive against the 116,000 men and 547 tanks of the Panzerarmee. Prelude Allied plan Topic Operation Lightfoot Montgomery's plan was for a main attack to the north of the line and a secondary attack to the south involving 30th Corps Lieutenant General Oliver Lees and 13th Corps Lieutenant General Brian Horrocks while 10th Corps Lieutenant General Herbert Lumsden was to exploit the success with Operation Lightfoot Montgomery intended to cut two corridors through the Axis minefields in the north one corridor was to run southwest through the 2nd New Zealand Division sector towards the centre of Maiteria Ridge, while the second was to run west, passing 2 miles .2 km north of the west end of the Maiteria Ridge across the 9th Australian and 51st Highland Division sectors. Tanks would then pass through and defeat the German armour. Diversions at Ruisat Ridge in the center and also the south of the line would keep the rest of the Axis forces from moving northwards. Montgomery expected a 12-day battle in three stages, the break-in, the dogfight and the final breaking of the enemy. For the first night of the offensive, Montgomery planned for four infantry divisions of 30th Corps to advance on a 16 miles 26 km front to the Oxalic Line, overrunning the forward Axis defenses. Engineers would clear and mark the two lanes through the minefields, through which the armoured divisions from 10th Corps would pass to gain the Pearson Line. They would rally and consolidate their position just west of the infantry positions, blocking an Axis tank counter-attack. The British tanks would then advance to Skinflint, astride the north-south Raman track deep in the Axis defensive system, to challenge the Axis armour. The infantry battle would continue as the 8th Army Infantry crumbled. The deep axis defensive fortifications, three successive lines of fortification had been constructed and destroy any tanks that attacked them. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Operation Bertram The Commonwealth forces practiced a number of deceptions in the months before the battle to confuse the Axis command as to the whereabouts of the forthcoming battle and when the battle was likely to occur. This operation was codenamed Operation Bertram. In September, they dumped waste materials discarded packing cases, etc. under camouflage nets in the northern sector, making them appear to be ammunition or ration dumps. The Axis naturally noticed these but, as no offensive action immediately followed and the «dumps» did not change in appearance, they were subsequently ignored. This allowed 8th Army to build up supplies in the forward area unnoticed by the Axis, by replacing the rubbish with ammunition, petrol or rations at night. Meanwhile, a dummy pipeline was built, hopefully leading the Axis to believe the attack would occur much later than it, in fact, did and much further south. To further the illusion, dummy tanks consisting of plywood frames placed over jeeps were constructed and deployed in the south. In a reverse feint, the tanks destined for battle in the north were disguised as supply trucks by placing removable plywood superstructures over them. Topic. Operation Braganza 
As a preliminary, the 131st Queens Infantry Brigade of the 44th Home Counties Infantry Division, supported by tanks from the 4th Armored Brigade, launched Operation Braganza attacking the 185th Airborne Division Folgor on the night of 29-30 September in an attempt to capture the Deir el Munasib area. The Italian paratroopers repelled the attack, killing or capturing over 300 of the attackers. It was wrongly assumed that Fallschirmjäger German paratroopers had manned the defences and been responsible for the British reverse. The Africa Corps War Diary notes that the Italian paratroops bore the brunt of the attack. It fought well and inflicted heavy losses on the enemy. Topic: <laughs> Axis Plan With the failure of the offensive at the Battle of Alam el Hafa, the Axis forces went on to the defensive but losses had not been excessive. The Axis supply line from Tripoli was extremely long and captured Allied supplies and equipment had been exhausted, but Rommel decided to advance into Egypt. The Eighth Army was being supplied with men and materials from the United Kingdom, India, Australia and New Zealand, as well as with trucks and the new Sherman tanks from the United States. Rommel continued to request equipment, supplies and fuel but the priority of the German war effort was the Eastern Front and very limited supplies reached North Africa. Rommel was ill and in early September, arrangements were made for him to return to Germany on sick leave and for General der Panzertruppe Georg Stumme to transfer from the Russian front to take his place. Before he left for Germany on 23 September, Rommel organized the defense and wrote a long appreciation of the situation to Oberkommando der Wehrmacht OKW Armed Forces High Command, once again setting out the essential needs of the Panzer Army. Rommel knew that the British Commonwealth forces would soon be strong enough to attack. His only hope now relied on the German forces fighting in the Battle of Stalingrad quickly to defeat the Red Army, then move south through the Transcaucasus and threaten Iran Persia and the Middle East. If successful, large numbers of British and Commonwealth forces would have to be sent from the Egyptian front to reinforce the Ninth Army in Iran, leading to the postponement of any offensive against his army. Rommel hoped to convince OKW to reinforce his forces for the eventual link-up between Panzerarmee Africa and the German armies fighting in southern Russia, enabling them finally to defeat the British and Commonwealth armies in North Africa and the Middle East. In the meantime, the Panzerarmee dug in and waited for the attack by the Eighth Army or the defeat of the Red Army at Stalingrad. Rommel added depth to his defences by creating at least two belts of mines about 3.1 miles 5 km apart, connected at intervals to create boxes Devil's Gardens, which would restrict enemy penetration and deprive British armour of room for manoeuvre. The front face of each box was lightly held by battle outposts and the rest of the box was unoccupied but sewed with mines and explosive traps and covered by enfilading fire. The main defensive positions were built to a depth of at least 2 km .2 miles behind the second mine belt. The Axis laid around half a million mines, mostly Teller anti-tank mines with some smaller anti-personnel types such as the S mine. Many of these mines were British, and had been captured at Tobruk. To lure enemy vehicles into the minefields, the Italians dragged an axle and tires through the fields using a long rope to create what appeared to be well used tracks. Rommel did not want the British armour to break out into the open because he had neither the strength of numbers nor fuel to match them in a battle of manoeuvre. The battle had to be fought in the fortified zones, a breakthrough had to be defeated quickly. Rommel stiffened his forward lines by alternating German and Italian infantry formations. Because the Allied deception confused the Axis as to the point of attack, Rommel departed from his usual practice of holding his armoured strength in a concentrated reserve and split it into a northern group 15th Panzer and Littorio Division and a southern group 21st Panzer and Ariete Division, each organised into battle groups to be able to make a quick armoured intervention wherever the blow fell and prevent narrow breakthroughs from being enlarged. A significant proportion of his armoured reserve was dispersed and held unusually far forward. 
The 15th Panzer Division had 125 operational tanks 16 PZ, IIs, 43 PZ, 3 AUSFH, 43 PZ, 3 AUSFJ, 6 PZ, IV AUSFD, 15 PZ, IV AUSFF, while the 21st Panzer Division had 121 operational combat vehicles 12 PZ, IIs, 38 PZ, 3 AUSFH, 43 PZ, 3 AUSFJ, J, 2 PZ, IVA USFD, 15 PZ, IVA USFF. Rommel held the 90th Light Division further back and kept the Trieste Motorized Division in reserve near the coast. Rommel hoped to move his troops faster than the Allies, to concentrate his defenses at the most important point, Schwerpunkt, but lack of fuel meant that once the Panzerarmee had concentrated, it would not be able to move again because of lack of fuel. The British were well aware that Rommel would be unable to mount a defence based on his usual manoeuvre tactics but no clear picture emerged of how he would fight the battle and British plans seriously underestimated the Axis defences and the fighting power of the Panzerarmee. <laughs> <laughs> battle Topic. Phase 1 – The break-in Prior to the main barrage, there was a diversion by the 24th Australian Brigade, which involved the 15th Panzer Division being subjected to heavy fire for a few minutes. Then at 21.40 Egyptian summer time on 23 October on a calm, clear evening under the bright sky of a full moon, Operation Lightfoot began with a 1,000-gun barrage. The fire plan had been arranged so that the first rounds from the 882 guns from the field and medium batteries would land along the 40 miles 64 km front at the same time. After 20 minutes of general bombardment, the guns switched to precision targets in support of the advancing infantry. The shelling plan continued for five and a half hours, by the end of which each gun had fired about 600 rounds, about 529,000 shells. Operation Lightfoot alluded to the infantry attacking first. Anti-tank mines would not be tripped by soldiers stepping on them since they were too light. As the infantry advanced, engineers had to clear a path for the tanks coming behind. Each gap was to be 24 feet meters wide, which was just enough to get tanks through in single file. The engineers had to clear a 5 miles kilometers route through the Devil's Gardens. It was a difficult task that was not achieved because of the depth of the Axis minefields. At 2200, the four infantry divisions of 30th Corps began to move. The objective was to establish a bridgehead before dawn at the imaginary line in the desert where the strongest enemy defences were situated, on the far side of the second mine belt. Once the infantry reached the first minefields, the mine sweepers, including reconnaissance corps troops and sappers, moved in to create a passage for the armoured divisions of 10th Corps. Progress was slower than planned but at 2 o'clock, the first of the 500 tanks crawled forward. By 4 o'clock, the lead tanks were in the minefields, where they stirred up so much dust that there was no visibility at all, traffic jams developed and tanks bogged down. Only about half of the infantry attained their objectives and none of the tanks broke through. The 7th Armoured Division with one Free French Brigade under command from 13th Corps Lieutenant General Brian Horrocks made a secondary attack to the south. The main attack aimed to achieve a breakthrough, engage and pin down the 21st Panzer Division and the Ariete Armoured Division around Jebel Kalak, while the Free French on the far left were to secure Karat El Haimai Mat and the El Taka Plateau. The right flank of the attack was to be protected by 44th Infantry Division with the 131st Infantry Brigade. The attack met determined resistance, mainly from the 185 Airborne Division Folgor, part of the Ramke Parachute Brigade and the Kyle Group. The minefields were deeper than anticipated and clearing paths through them was impeded by Axis defensive fire. 
By dawn on 24 October, paths still had not been cleared through the second minefield to release 22nd and 4th Light Armoured Brigades into the open to make their plan turn north into the rear of enemy positions 5 miles west of Deir el Munasib. Further north along the 13th Corps front, the 50th Infantry Division achieved a limited and costly success against determined resistance from the Pavia Division, Brescia Division, and elements of the 185th Airborne. Division Folgor. The 4th Indian Infantry Division, on the far left of the 30th Corps front at Ruisat Ridge, made a mock attack and two small raids intended to deflect attention to the centre of the front. <laughs> <laughs> Phase 2 – The Crumbling Dawn aerial reconnaissance showed little change in Axis disposition, so Montgomery gave his orders for the day, the clearance of the Northern Corridor should be completed and the New Zealand Division supported by 10th Armoured should push south from Maiteria Ridge. 9th Australian Division, in the north, should plan a crumbling operation for that night, while in the southern sector, 7th Armoured should continue to try to break through the minefields with support, if necessary, from 44th Division. Panzer units counter-attacked the 51st Highland Division just after sunrise, only to be stopped in their tracks. The morning of Saturday 24 October brought disaster for the German headquarters. The reports that Stumme had received that morning showed the attacks had been on a broad front but that such penetration as had occurred should be containable by local units. He went forward himself to observe the state of affairs and, finding himself under fire, suffered a heart attack and died. Temporary command was given to Major General Wilhelm Ritter von Thoma. Hitler had already decided that Rommel should leave his sanatorium and return to North Africa. Rommel flew to Rome early on 25 October to press the Commando Supremo for more fuel and ammunition and then on to North Africa to resume command that night of the Panzer Army Africa, which that day was renamed the German-Italian Panzer Army Deutsch-Italienische Panzerarmee. There was little activity during the day pending more complete clearance of paths through the minefields. The armor was held at Oxalic. Artillery and the Allied Desert Air Force, making over 1,000 sorties, attacked Axis positions all day to aid the crumbling of the Axis forces. By 1600 there was little progress. At dusk, with the sun at their backs, Axis tanks from the 15th Panzer Division and Italian Littorio Division swung out from the kidney feature also known to the Germans and Italians as Hill 28, often wrongly called a ridge as it was actually a depression, to engage the 1st Armoured Division and the first major tank battle of El Alamein began. Over 100 tanks were involved and half were destroyed by dark. Neither position was altered. At around 10 o'clock, Axis aircraft had destroyed a convoy of 25 Allied vehicles carrying petrol and ammunition, setting off a night long blaze. Lumsden wanted to call off the attack, but Montgomery made it clear that his plans were to be carried out. The thrust that night by 10th Armoured Division from Maiteria Ridge failed. The lifting of mines on the Maiteria Ridge and beyond took far longer than planned and the leading unit, 8th Armoured Brigade, was caught on the start line at 2200—0 hour—by an air attack and were scattered. By the time they had reorganized they were well behind schedule and out of touch with the creeping artillery barrage. By daylight the brigade was out in the open taking considerable fire from well-sighted tanks and anti-tank guns. Meanwhile 24th Armoured Brigade had pushed forward and reported at dawn they were on the Pearson line, although it turned out that, in the dust and confusion, they had mistaken their position and were well short, the attack in the 13th Corps sector to the south fared no better. 44th Division's 131st Infantry Brigade cleared a path through the mines, but when 22nd Armoured Brigade passed through, they came under heavy fire and were repulsed, with 31 tanks disabled. Allied air activity that night focused on Rommel's Northern Armoured Group, where 135 short tons of bombs were dropped. To prevent a recurrence of 8th Armoured Brigade's experience from the air, attacks on Axis landing fields were also stepped up. <laughs> Topic. 
D plus two twenty five October The initial thrust had ended by Sunday. The Allies had advanced through the minefields in the west to make a 6 miles wide and 5 miles deep inroad. They now sat atop Myteria Ridge in the southeast. Axis forces were firmly entrenched in most of their original battle positions and the battle was at a standstill. Montgomery decided that the planned advance southward from Myteria Ridge by the New Zealanders would be too costly and instead decided that 30th Corps, while keeping firm hold of Myteria, should strike northward toward the coast with 9th Australian Division. Meanwhile, 1st Armoured Division, on the Australians' left, should continue to attack west and northwest, and activity to the south on both Corps fronts would be confined to patrolling. The battle would be concentrated at the kidney feature and tell El Asa until a breakthrough occurred. By early morning, the Axis forces launched a series of attacks using 15th Panzer and Littorio divisions. The Panzer Army was probing for a weakness, but without success. When the sun set the Allied infantry went on the attack. Around midnight, 51st Division launched three attacks, but no one knew exactly where they were. Pandemonium and carnage ensued, resulting in the loss of over 500 Allied troops, and leaving only one officer among the attacking forces. While the 51st Highland Division was operating around Kidney, the Australians were attacking Point 29, a 20 feet meters high axis artillery observation post southwest of Tel El Asa, in an attempt to surround the Axis coastal salient containing the German 164th Light Division and large numbers of Italian infantry. This was the new northern thrust Montgomery had devised earlier in the day, and was to be the scene of heated battle for some days. The Australian 26th Brigade attacked at midnight, supported by artillery and 30 tanks of 40th Royal Tank Regiment. They took the position and 240 prisoners. Fighting continued in this area for the next week, as the Axis tried to recover the small hill that was so important to their defence. Meanwhile, the Air Force night bombers dropped 115 short tons 140 of bombs on targets in the battlefield and 14 short tons 13T on the Stuka base at Sidi Hanish, while night fighters flew patrols over the battle area and the Axis forward landing grounds. In the south, the 4th Armoured Brigade and 69th Infantry Brigade attacked the Folgor 187th Regiment at Deer Munasib, but lost about 20 tanks gaining only the forward positions. <laughs> Phase 3 – The Counter D plus 326 October Rommel, on his return to North Africa on the evening of 25 October, assessed the battle. Casualties, particularly in the north, as a result of incessant artillery and air attack, had been severe. The Italian Trento Division had lost 50% of its infantry and most of its artillery, the 164th Light Division had lost two battalions. The 15th Panzer and Littorio Divisions had prevented the Allied tanks from breaking through but this had been a costly defensive success, the 15th Panzer Division being reduced to 31 tanks remaining. Most other units were also under strength, the men were on half rations, a large number were sick and Panzerarme Africa had only enough fuel for three days. Rommel was convinced by this time that the main assault would come in the north and determined to retake point 29. He ordered a counterattack against it by the 15th Panzer Division and the 164th Light Division, with part of the Italian 20th Corps to begin at 1500 but under constant artillery and air attack this came to nothing. According to Rommel this attack did meet some success, with the Italians recapturing part of Hill 28. Attacks were now launched on Hill 28 by elements of the 15th Panzer Division, the Littorio and a Bersaglieri Battalion, supported by the concentrated fire of all the local artillery and AA. 
In the evening part of the Bersaglieri battalion succeeded in occupying the eastern and western edges of the hill. The bulk of the Australian 217th Battalion, which had defended the position, was forced to retreat. Rommel reversed his policy of distributing his armour across the front, ordering the 90th Light Division forward from Ed Dabba and 21st Panzer Division north along with one-third of the Ariete Division and half the artillery from the southern sector to join the 15th Panzer Division and the Littorio Division. The move could not be reversed because of the fuel shortage. The Trieste Division was ordered from Fuca to replace the 90th Light Division at Ed Dabba but the 21st Panzer Division and the Ariete Division made slow progress during the night under constant attack from DAV bombers. At the Kidney feature, the British failed to take advantage of the missing tanks. Each time they tried to move forward they were stopped by anti-tank guns. The Allied offensive was stalled. Churchill railed. Is it really impossible to find a general who can win a battle? Three Vickers Wellington torpedo bombers of 38 Squadron destroyed the oil tanker Turgistia at Tobruk during the night. Bristol Beaufort torpedo bombers of 42 Squadron, attached to No. 47 Squadron, sank the tanker Proserpina at Tobruk, removing the last hope for refueling the Panzerarmee. By 26 October, 30th Corps had completed the capture of the bridgehead west of the 2nd Mine Belt. The tanks of 10th Corps, established just beyond the infantry, had failed to break through the Axis anti tank defences. Montgomery decided that over the next two days, while continuing the process of attrition, he would thin out his front line to create a reserve for another attack. The reserve was to include the 2nd New Zealand Division with the 9th Armoured Brigade under command, the 10th Armoured Division and the 7th Armoured Division. The attacks in the south, which lasted three days and caused considerable losses without achieving a breakthrough, were suspended. <laughs> D plus 4 27 October By this time, the main battle was concentrated around Tel El Akaka and the kidney feature at the end of 1st Armoured Division's path through the minefield. A mile northwest of the feature was Outpost Woodcock and roughly the same distance southwest lay Outpost Snipe. An attack was planned on these areas using two battalions from 7th Motor Brigade. At 2300 on 26 October 2nd Battalion, the Rifle Brigade would attack Snipe and 2nd Battalion King's Royal Rifle Corps KRRC would attack Woodcock. The plan was for 2nd Armoured Brigade to pass round the north of Woodcock the following dawn and 24th Armoured Brigade round the south of Snipe. The attack was to be supported by all the available artillery of both 10th and 30th Corps. Both battalions had difficulty finding their way in the dark and dust. At dawn, the KRRC had not reached its objective and had to find cover and dig in some distance from Woodcock. 2nd Rifle Brigade had had better fortune and after following the shell bursts of the supporting artillery dug in when they concluded they had reached their objective having encountered little opposition, at 6 o'clock, the 2nd Armoured Brigade commenced its advance and ran into such stiff opposition that, by noon, it had still not linked with the KRRC. The 24th Armoured Brigade started a little later and was soon in contact with the Rifle Brigade having shelled them in error for a while. Some hours of confused fighting ensued involving tanks from the Littorio and troops and anti-tank guns from 15th Panzer which managed to keep the British armour at bay in spite of the support of the Rifle Brigade Battlegroup's anti-tank guns. Rommel had decided to make two counter-attacks using his fresh troops. 90th Light Division was to make a fresh attempt to capture Point 29 and 21st Panzer were targeted at Snipe the Ariete detachment had returned south, at Snipe, mortar and shellfire was constant all day long. At 1600, Rommel launched his major attack. German and Italian tanks moved forward. Against them the Rifle Brigade had 13 six-pounder anti-tank guns along with six more from the supporting 239th anti-tank battery, RA. Although on the point of being overrun more than once they held their ground, destroying 22 German and 10 Italian tanks. 
The Germans gave up but in error the British battle group was withdrawn without being replaced that evening. Its CO, Lieutenant Colonel Victor Buller Turner, was awarded the Victoria Cross. Only one anti-tank gun, from 239 Battery, was brought back, when it was discovered that neither Woodcock nor Snipe was in 8th Army hands, 133rd Lorried Infantry Brigade was sent to capture them. By 1.30 on 28 October, the 4th Battalion Royal Sussex Regiment judged they were on Woodcock and dug in. At dawn, 2nd Armoured Brigade moved up in support but before contact could be made 4th Royal Sussex were counter-attacked and overrun with many losses. Meanwhile, the Lorried Brigade's two other battalions had moved on Snipe and dug in, only to find out the next day that they were in fact well short of their objective. Further north, the 90th Light Division's attack on Point 29 during the afternoon of 27 October failed under heavy artillery and bombing which broke up the attack before it had closed with the Australians. The action at Snipe was an episode of the Battle of El Alamein described by the regiment's historian as the most famous day of the regiment's war. Lucas Phillips, in his Alamein records that The desert was quivering with heat. The gun detachments and the platoons squatted in their pits and trenches, the sweat running in rivers down their dust-caked faces. There was a terrible stench. The flies swarmed in black clouds upon the dead bodies and excreta and tormented the wounded. The place was strewn with burning tanks and carriers, wrecked guns and vehicles, and overall drifted the smoke and the dust from bursting high explosives and from the blasts of guns. D plus 5 to 6 28 minus 29 October On 28 October 15th and 21st Panzer made a determined attack on the 10th Corps front but were halted by sustained artillery, tank and anti-tank gun fire. In the afternoon, they paused to regroup to attack again but they were bombed for two and a half hours and were prevented from even forming up. This proved to be Rommel's last attempt to take the initiative and as such his defeat here represented a turning point in the battle. At this point, Montgomery ordered the 10th Corps formations in the Woodcock Snipe area to go over to defense while he focused his army's attack further to the north. Late on 27 October, the British 133rd Brigade was sent forward to recover lost positions but the next day, a good part of this force was overrun by German and Italian tanks from the Littorio and supporting 12th Bersaglieri Regiment and several hundred British soldiers were captured. On the night of 28-29 October, the 9th Australian Division was ordered to make a second set-piece attack. The 20th Australian Infantry Brigade with 40th RTR in support would push northwest from Point 29 to form a base for 26th Australian Infantry Brigade with 46th RTR in support, to attack northeast to an Axis location south of the railway known as Thompson's Post and then over the railway to the Coast Road, where they would advance southeast to close on the rear of the Axis troops in the coastal salient. An attack by the 3rd Brigade would then be launched on the salient from the southeast. The 20th Brigade took its objectives with little trouble, but 26th Brigade had more trouble. Because of the distances involved, the troops were riding on 46th RTR. Valentine tanks as well as carriers, which mines and anti tank guns soon brought to grief, forcing the infantry to dismount. The infantry and tanks lost touch with each other in fighting with the 125th Panzergrenadier Regiment and a battalion of 7th Bersaglieri Regiment sent to reinforce the sector and the advance came to a halt. The Australians suffered 200 casualties in that attack and suffered 27 killed and 290 wounded. The German and Italian forces that had participated in the counterattack formed an outpost and held on until the arrival of German reinforcements on 1 November. It became clear that there were no longer enough hours of darkness left to reform, continue the attack and see it to its conclusion, so the operation was called off. 
By the end of these engagements in late October, the British had 800 tanks still in operation, while the Panzerarmee Day report for the 28th of October, intercepted and read by 8th Army the following evening, recorded 81 serviceable German tanks and 197 Italian. With the help of signals intelligence information the Proserpina carrying 4500 tons of fuel and Turgistia carrying 1000 tons of fuel and 1000 tons of ammunition had been destroyed on the 26th of October and the tanker Louisiano carrying 2500 tons of fuel had been sunk off the west coast of Greece by a torpedo from a Wellington bomber on the 28th of October Rommel told his commanders it will be quite impossible for us to disengage from the enemy. There is no gasoline for such a maneuver. We have only one choice and that is to fight to the end at Alamein." These actions by the Australians and British had alerted Montgomery that Rommel had committed his reserve in the form of 90th Light Division to the front and that its presence in the coastal sector suggested that Rommel was expecting the next major Eighth Army offensive in this sector. Montgomery determined therefore that it would take place further south on a 4,000 yards 2.3 miles, 3.7 kilometers front south of Point 29. The attack was to take place on the night of 31 October, 1 November, as soon as he had completed the reorganization of his front line to create the reserves needed for the offensive, although in the event it was postponed by 24 hours. To keep Rommel's attention on the coastal sector, Montgomery ordered the renewal of the 9th Australian Division operation on the night of 30 31st October. Topic D plus 7 to 9 30 October the 1st of November. The night of 30 October saw a continuation of previous Australian plans, their third attempt to reach the paved road. Although not all the objectives were achieved, by the end of the night they were astride the road and the railway, making the position of the Axis troops in the salient precarious. Rommel brought up a battlegroup from 21. Panzer Division and on 31 October, launched four successive attacks against Thompson's Post. The fighting was intense and often hand-to-hand, -hand, but no ground was gained by the Axis forces. One of the Australians killed was Sergeant William Kibbe 248th Infantry Battalion, who, for his heroic actions from the 23rd until his death on the 31st, including a lone attack on a machine gun position at his own initiative, was awarded the Victoria Cross. Again, on Sunday, the 1st of November, Rommel tried to dislodge the Australians, but the brutal, desperate fighting resulted in nothing but lost men and equipment. He did however regain contact with Panzergrenadier Regiment 125 in the nose of the salient, and the supporting 10 degrees Battaglione Bersaglieri, that fought well according to German and Allied sources, the Bersaglieri had resisted several Australian attacks even though they were, in the words of military historian Niall Barr, surrounded on all sides, short of ammunition, food and water, and unable to evacuate their many wounded. By now, it had become obvious to Rommel that the battle was lost. His fuel state continued to be critical. On 1 November, two more supply ships the Tripolino and the Ostia had been torpedoed and sunk from the air northwest of Tobruk. The shortage forced him to rely increasingly on fuel flown in from Crete on the orders of Albert Kesselring, Luftwaffe Oberbefels Harbour Sud, Ob Sud, Supreme Commander South. Despite the restrictions imposed by heavy bombing of the airfields in Crete and the Desert Air Force's efforts to intercept the transport aircraft, Rommel began to plan a retreat anticipating retiring to Fuca, some 50 miles 80 km west, as he had only 90 tanks remaining in stark contrast with the Allies' eight. 800. Large amounts of fuel arrived at Benghazi after the German forces had started to retreat, but little of it reached the front, a fact Kesselring tried to change by delivering it more closely to the fighting forces. <laughs> Phase 4 – Operation Supercharge Topic D plus ten to two November. 
This phase of the battle began at 1 o'clock on 2 November, with the objective of destroying enemy armor, forcing the enemy to fight in the open, reducing the Axis stock of petrol, attacking and occupying enemy supply routes, and causing the disintegration of the enemy army. The intensity and the destruction in supercharge were greater than anything witnessed so far during this battle. The objective of this operation was Tel El Akaka, the base of the Axis defense roughly 3 miles kilometers northwest of the Kidney Feature and situated on the Raman lateral track. The initial thrust of supercharge was to be carried out by the 2nd New Zealand Division. Lieutenant General Bernard Freyberg had tried to free them of this task, as they had lost 1,405 men in just three days, at El Ruwisat Ridge in July. However, in addition to its own 5th New Zealand Infantry Brigade and 28th Maori Infantry Battalion, the division was to have had placed under its command 151st Durham Brigade from 50th Division, 152nd Seaforth and Camerons Brigade from 51st Division and the 133rd Royal Sussex Lorried Infantry Brigade. In addition, the division was to have British 9th Armoured Brigade under command, as in Operation Lightfoot, it was planned that two infantry brigades the 151st on the right and 152nd on the left each this time supported by a regiment of tanks—the 8th and 50th Royal Tank Regiments—would advance and clear a path through the mines. Once they reached their objectives, 4,000 yards 3, meters distant, 9th Armoured Brigade would pass through supported by a heavy artillery barrage and break open a gap in the Axis defences on and around the Raman track, some 2,000 yards 1, meters further forward, which the 1st Armoured Division, following behind, would pass through into the open to take on Rommel's armoured reserves. Rommel had ordered 21st Panzer Division from the front line on 31 October to form a mobile counter-attacking force. The division had left behind a Panzer Grenadier Regiment which would bolster the Trieste Division which had been ordered forward to replace it. Rommel had also interspersed formations from the Trieste and 15th Panzer Divisions to «course it» his weaker forces in the front line. On 1 November the two German armoured divisions had 102 effective tanks to face supercharge and the Littorio and Trieste divisions had 65 tanks between them. Supercharge started with a seven-hour aerial bombardment focused on Tel El Akaka and Sidi Abd El Rahman, followed by a four-and-a-half-hour barrage of 360 guns firing 15,000 shells. The two assault brigades started their attack at 1.05 on 2 November and gained most of their objectives to schedule and with moderate losses. On the right of the main attack 28 battalion captured positions to protect the right flank of the newly formed salient and 133rd lorried infantry did the same on the left. New Zealand engineers cleared five lines through the mines allowing the Royal Dragoons Armoured Car Regiment to slip out into the open and spend the day raiding the Axis communications. The 9th Armoured Brigade had started its approach march at 2000 on 1 November from El Alamein railway station with around 130 tanks and arrived at its start line with only 94 runners operational tanks. The brigade was to have started its attack towards Tel El Akaka at 5.45 behind a barrage. The attack was postponed for 30 minutes while the brigade regrouped on Curry's orders. At 6.15, 30 minutes before dawn, the three regiments of the brigade advanced towards the gun line. We all realize that for armor to attack a wall of guns sounds like another balaclava, it is properly an infantry job but there are no more infantry available. So our armor must do it. Brigadier Curry had tried to get the brigade out of doing this job, stating that he believed the brigade would be attacking on too wide a front with no reserves and that they would most likely have 50% losses. The reply came from Freyberg that Montgomery was aware of the risk and has accepted the possibility of losing 100% casualties in 9th Armoured Brigade to make the break, but in view of the promise of immediate following through of the 1st Armoured Division, the risk was not considered as great as all that. 
The German and Italian anti-tank guns, mostly Pak 38 and Italian 47 mm guns, along with 24 of the formidable 88 mm flak guns, opened fire upon the charging tanks silhouetted by the rising sun. German tanks, which had penetrated between the Warwickshire Yeomanry and Royal Wiltshire Yeomanry, also caused many casualties. British tanks attacking the Folgore sector were fought off with petrol bombs and mortar fire as well as with the obsolete Italian 47mm cannons. The Axis gun screen started to inflict a steady amount of damage upon the advancing tanks but was unable to stop them. Over the course of the next 30 minutes, around 35 guns were destroyed and several hundred prisoners taken. The 9th Armoured Brigade had started the attack with 94 tanks and was reduced to only 14 operational tanks and of the 400 tank crew involved in the attack, 230 were killed, wounded or captured. After the brigade's action, Brigadier Gentry of 6th New Zealand Brigade went ahead to survey the scene. On seeing Brigadier Curry asleep on a stretcher, he approached him saying, Sorry to wake you John, but I'd like to know where your tanks are." Curry waved his hand at a group of tanks around him and replied, "'There they are.' Gentry said, "'I don't mean your headquarters tanks, I mean your armoured regiments. Where are they?' Curry waved his arm and again replied, "'There are my armoured regiments, Bill.' The brigade had sacrificed itself upon the gun line and caused great damage but had failed to create the gap for the 1st Armoured Division to pass through, however, soon after dawn 1st Armoured Division started to deploy and the remains of 9th Armoured Brigade came under its command. 2nd Armoured Brigade came up behind the 9th, and by mid-morning 8th Armoured Brigade had come up on its left, ordered to advance to the southwest. In heavy fighting during the day the British armour made little further progress. At 11 o'clock on 2 November, the remains of 15th Panzer, 21st Panzer and Littorio Armoured Divisions counter-attacked 1st Armoured Division and the remains of 9th Armoured Brigade, which by that time had dug in with a screen of anti-tank guns and artillery together with intensive air support. The counterattack failed under a blanket of shells and bombs, resulting in a loss of some 100 tanks. Although 10th Corps had failed in its attempt to break out, it had succeeded in its objective of finding and destroying enemy tanks. Although tank losses were approximately equal, this represented only a portion of the total British armour, but most of Rommel's tanks, the Africa Corps' strength of tanks fit for battle fell by 70 while in addition to the losses of the 9th Armoured Brigade, the 2nd and 8th Armoured Brigades lost 14 tanks in the fighting, with another 40 damaged or broken down. The fighting was later termed the hammering of the panzers. In the late afternoon and early evening, the 133rd Lorried and 151st Infantry Brigades—by this time back under command of 51st Infantry Division—attacked respectively the Snipe and Skinflint about a mile west of Snipe positions in order to form a base for future operations. The heavy artillery concentration which accompanied their advance suppressed the opposition from the Trieste Division and the operation succeeded with few casualties. On the night of 2 November, Montgomery once again reshuffled his infantry in order to bring four brigades 5th Indian, 151st, 5th New Zealand, and 154th into reserve under 30th Corps to prepare for the next thrust. He also reinforced 10th Corps by moving 7th Armoured Division from Army Reserve and sending 4th Light Armoured Brigade from 13th Corps in the south. General von Thoma's report to Rommel that night said he would have at most 35 tanks available to fight the next day and his artillery and anti-tank weapons had been reduced to one-third of their strength at the start of the battle. Rommel concluded that to forestall a breakthrough and the resulting destruction of his whole army he must start withdrawing to the planned position at Fuca. He called up Ariete from the south to join the mobile Italian 20th Corps around Tel El Akaka. His mobile forces 20th Corps, Africa Corps, 90th Light Division and 19th Flak Division were ordered to make a fighting withdrawal while his other formations were to withdraw as best they could with the limited transport available. Topic: 
D plus eleven to three November At 2030 on the 2nd of November, Lumsden decided that one more effort by his 10th Corps would see the gun screen on the Raman track defeated and ordered 7th Motor Brigade to seize the track along a 2 miles front north of Tel El Akarka. The 2nd and 8th Armoured Brigades would then pass through the infantry to a distance of about 3.5 miles on the morning of 3 November 7th Armoured Division would pass through and swing north heading for the railway at Ghazal Station. 7th Motor Brigade set off at 1.15 on 3 November, but having received its orders late, had not had the chance to reconnoitre the battle area in daylight. This combined with stiff resistance led to the failure of their attack. As a consequence, the orders for the armor were changed and 2nd Armored Brigade was tasked to support the forward battalion of 133rd Lorry Brigade 2nd King's Royal Rifle Corps and 8th Armored Brigade was to push southwest. Fighting continued throughout 3 November, but 2nd Armored was held off by elements of the Africa Corps and tanks of the Littorio Division. Further south, 8th Armoured Brigade was held off by anti-tank units helped later by tanks of the arriving Ariete Division. <laughs> Phase 5 – The Breakout On 2 November, Rommel let Hitler know that the army's strength was so exhausted after its ten days of battle that it was not now capable of offering any effective opposition to the enemy's next breakthrough attempt. With our great shortage of vehicles an orderly withdrawal of the non-motorized forces appeared impossible. In these circumstances we had to reckon, at the least, with the gradual destruction of the army. At 13.30 on 3 November Rommel received a reply to Field Marshal Rommel. It is with trusting confidence in your leadership and the courage of the German-Italian troops under your command that the German people and I are following the heroic struggle in Egypt. In the situation which you find yourself there can be no other thought but to stand fast, yield not a yard of ground and throw every gun and every man into the battle. Considerable air force reinforcements are being sent to sea in sea south. The Duchy and the Commando Supremo are also making the utmost efforts to send you the means to continue the fight. Your enemy, despite his superiority, must also be at the end of his strength. It would not be the first time in history that a strong will has triumphed over the bigger battalions. As to your troops, you can show them no other road than that to victory or death. Adolf Hitler. Rommel thought the order, similar to one that had been given at the same time by Benito Mussolini through the Commando Supremo, demanded the impossible. We were completely stunned, and for the first time in the African campaign I did not know what to do. A kind of apathy took hold of us as we issued orders for all existing positions to be held on instructions from the highest authority. Rommel ordered X and 21st Italian Corps and 90th Light Division to hold while the Africa Corps withdrew approximately 6 miles west during the night of 3 November with 20th Italian Corps and the Ariete Division conforming to their position. He then replied to Hitler confirming his determination to hold the battlefield. The Desert Air Force continued to apply huge pressure. In its biggest day of the battle, it flew 1,208 sorties and dropped 396 short tons t of bombs. On the night of 3 quarters November, Montgomery ordered three of the infantry brigades he had gathered into reserve to advance on the Raman track as a prelude to an armored breakout. At 1745, the 152nd Infantry Brigade and the 8th RTR in support, attacked about 2 miles .2 kilometers south of Tel El Akaka. The 5th Indian Infantry Brigade was to attack the track 4 miles .4 kilometers south during the early hours of 4 November. At 6.15, the 154th Infantry Brigade was to attack Tel El Akaka. 
The first attack, having been mistakenly told the Axis had withdrawn from their objectives, met determined resistance. Communication failures made things worse and the forward infantry elements ended up digging in well short of their objective. By the time the 5th Indian Brigade set off, the defenders had started to withdraw and their objective was taken virtually unopposed. By the time the 154th Brigade moved forward, although they met some shelling, the Axis had left. Topic D plus 12, the 4th of November On the 4th of November, the 8th Army plan for pursuit began at dawn, no fresh units were available and the 1st and 7th Armoured Divisions were to turn northwards to roll up the Axis units still in the forward lines. The 2nd New Zealand Division with two lorry-borne infantry brigades and the 9th Armoured and 4th Light Armoured Brigades under command, was to head west along desert tracks to the escarpment above Fuka, about 60 miles away. The New Zealanders got off to a slow start because its units were dispersed after the recent fighting and took time to concentrate. Paths through the minefields were congested and had deteriorated, which caused more delays. By dark, Freyberg had leaguered his force only 15 miles 24 kilometers west of the Raman track, although the 9th Armoured Brigade was still at the track and 6th New Zealand Brigade even further back, the plan to trap the 90th Light Division with 1st and 7th Armoured Divisions misfired. The 1st Armoured Division came into contact with the remnants of 21st Panzer Division and had to spend most of the day pushing them back 8 miles 13 kilometers. The 7th Armoured Division was held up by the Ariete Armoured Division, which was destroyed conducting a determined resistance. In his diary, Rommel wrote enormous dust clouds could be seen south and southeast of headquarters of the dark, where the desperate struggle of the small and inefficient Italian tanks of 20th Corps was being played out against the hundred or so British heavy tanks which had come round their open right flank. I was later told by Major von Luck, whose battalion I had sent to close the gap between the Italians and the Africa Corps, that the Italians, who at that time represented our strongest motorized force, fought with exemplary courage. Tank after tank split asunder or burned out, while all the time a tremendous British barrage lay over the Italian infantry and artillery positions. The last signal came from the Ariete at about 15.30 hours enemy tanks penetrated south of Ariete. Ariete now encircled. Location 5 km northwest Bur Labd. Ariete tanks still in action. Opening square bracket dot 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 closing square bracket. In the Ariete we lost our oldest Italian comrades, from whom we had probably always demanded more than they, with their poor armament, had been capable of performing. The Littorio Armoured Division and the Trieste Motorized Division were also destroyed. Berlin Radio claimed that in this sector the British were made to pay for their penetration with enormous losses in men and material. The Italians fought to the last man. The British took many prisoners, since the remnants of Italian infantry divisions were not motorized and could not escape from encirclement. Private Sid Martindale, 1st Battalion Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders, wrote about the Bologna division, which had taken the full weight of the British armoured attack. The more we advanced the more we realised that the Italians did not have much fight in them after putting up a strong resistance to our overwhelming advance and they started surrendering to our lead troops in droves. There was not much action to see but we came across lots of burnt out Italian tanks that had been destroyed by our tanks. I had never seen a battlefield before and the sight sick of so many dead was sickening. The Bologna and the remainder of the Trento division tried to fight their way out and marched into the desert without water, food or transport before surrendering exhausted and dying from dehydration. It was reported that Colonel Arrigo Dallolio, commanding the 40th Infantry Regiment of the Bologna, surrendered saying, We have ceased firing not because we haven't the desire but because we have spent every round. In a symbolic act of defiance, no one in 40th Bologna Infantry Regiment raised their hands. Harry Zinder of Time magazine noted that the Italians fought better than had been expected and commented that for the Italians, it was a terrific letdown by their German allies. They had fought a good fight. 
In the south, the famed Folgor Parachute Division fought to the last round of ammunition. Two armoured divisions and a motorised division, which had been interspersed among the German formations, thought they would be allowed to retire gracefully with Rommel's 21st, 15th and 19th sick light. But even that was denied them. When it became obvious to Rommel that there would be little chance to hold anything between El Daba and the frontier, his panzers dissolved, disintegrated and turned tail, leaving the Italians to fight a rear-guard action. By late morning on 4 November, Rommel realized his situation was desperate. The picture in the early afternoon of the 4th was as follows, powerful enemy armored forces, had burst a 19-kilometer hole in our front, through which strong bodies of tanks were moving to the west. As a result of this, our forces in the north were threatened with encirclement by enemy formations 20 times their number in tanks. There were no reserves, as every available man and gun had been put into the line. So now it had come, the thing we had done everything in our power to avoid, our front broken and the fully motorized enemy streaming into our rear. Superior orders could no longer count. We had to save what there was to be saved. Rommel telegraphed Hitler for permission to fall back on Fuca. As further Allied blows fell, Thoma was captured and reports came in from the Ariete and Trento divisions that they were encircled. At 17.30, unable to wait any longer for a reply from Hitler, Rommel gave orders to retreat. Due to lack transport, most of the Italian infantry formations were abandoned. Any chance of getting them away with an earlier move had been spoiled by Hitler's insistence that Rommel hold his ground, obliging him to keep the unmotorized Italian units well forward until it was too late. To deepen the armoured thrusts, the 1st Armoured Division was directed at El Daba, 15 miles 24 km down the coast and the 7th Armoured Division towards Galal, a further 24 km 15 miles west along the railway. The New Zealand Division Group had hoped to reach their objective by mid-morning on 5 November but was held up by shell fire when picking their way through what turned out to be a dummy minefield and the 15th Panzer Division got there first. Topic D plus thirteen, the fifth of November. Montgomery realized that to finish off the Axis, he would need to make even deeper armored thrusts. The Seventh Armored Division was ordered across country to cut the coast road at Sidi Hanish, sixty-five miles one hundred and five kilometers west of the Raman Track, while the First Armored Division, west of El Dada, was ordered to take a wide detour through the desert to Burkhalda, eighty miles one hundred and thirty kilometers west of the Raman Track, preparatory to turning north to cut the road at Mursa Matru. Both moves failed. The 7th Armored Division finished the day 20 miles 32 kilometers short of its objective. The 1st Armored Division tried to make up time with a night march, but in the darkness, the armor became separated from their support vehicles and ran out of fuel at dawn on the 6th of November, 16 mi 26 kilometers short of Burkhalda. The DAV continued to fly in support, but because of the dispersion of 10th Corps, it was difficult to establish bomb lines", beyond which, aircraft were free to attack. D plus 14, 6 November By 11 o'clock on 6 November, the B Echelon vehicles began to reach the 1st Armoured Division but with only enough fuel to replenish two of the armoured regiments, which set off again hoping to be in time to cut off the Axis. The regiments ran out of fuel again, 30 miles 48 km southwest of Mursa Matru. A fuel convoy had set out from Alamein on the evening of 5 November but progress was slow as the tracks had become very cut up. By midday on 6 November, it began to rain and the convoy bogged 40 miles 64 km from the rendezvous with the 1st Armoured Division B. Echelon support vehicles. The 2nd New Zealand Division advanced toward Sidi Hanish while the 8th Armoured Brigade, 10th Armoured Division, had moved west from Galal to occupy the landing fields at Fuca and the escarpment. 
roughly 15 miles 24 km southwest of Sidi Hanish, the 7th Armored Division encountered the 21st Panzer Division and the Voss Reconnaissance Group that morning. In a running fight, the 21st Panzer Division lost 16 tanks and numerous guns, narrowly escaping encirclement and reached Mercer Matru that evening. It was again difficult to define bomb lines but U.S. heavy bombers attacked Tobruk, sinking Ethiopia 2,153 long tons 2,188 t and later attacked Benghazi, sinking the Mars and setting the tanker Portofino 6,572 GRT, alight. D plus 15, 7 November On 7 November, waterlogged ground and lack of fuel stranded the 1st and 7th Armoured Divisions. The 10th Armoured Division on the coast road and with ample fuel, advanced to Mursa Matru while its infantry mopped up on the road west of Galal. Rommel intended to fight a delaying action at Sidi Barani, 80 miles 130 km west of Matru, to gain time for Axis troops to get through the bottlenecks at Harfire and Solemn. The last rearguards left Matru on the night of 7 8 November but were only able to hold Sidi Barani until the evening of 9 November. By the evening of 10 November, the 2nd New Zealand Division, heading for Solemn, had the 4th Light Armoured Brigade at the foot of the Harfire Pass while 7th Armoured Division was conducting another detour to the south, to take Fort Capuzzo and Sidi Azais. On the morning of the 11th of November, the 5th New Zealand Infantry Brigade captured the pass, taking 600 Italian prisoners. By nightfall on the 11th of November, the Egyptian wall was clear, but Montgomery was forced to order that the pursuit should temporarily be continued by armored cars and artillery only because of the difficulty in supplying larger formations west of Bardia. Topic. Aftermath Topic. Analysis El Alamein was an Allied victory, although Rommel did not lose hope until the end of the Tunisia campaign. Churchill said, It may almost be said, Before Alamein we never had a victory. After Alamein we never had a defeat. The Allies frequently had numerical superiority in the Western Desert but never had it been so complete in quantity and quality. With the arrival of Sherman tanks, six-pounder anti-tank guns and Spitfires in the Western Desert, the Allies gained a comprehensive superiority. Montgomery envisioned the battle as an attrition operation, similar to those fought in the First World War and accurately predicted the length of the battle and the number of Allied casualties. Allied artillery was superbly handled and Allied air support was excellent, in contrast to the Luftwaffe and Regia Aeronautica, which offered little or no support to ground forces, preferring to engage in air-to-air -air combat. Air supremacy had a huge effect on the battle. Montgomery wrote, The moral effect of air action on the enemy is very great and out of all proportion to the material damage inflicted. In the reverse direction, the sight and sound of our own air forces operating against the enemy have an equally satisfactory effect on our own troops. A combination of the two has a profound influence on the most important single factor in war. Morale. Historians debate the reasons Rommel decided to advance into Egypt. In 1997, Martin van Creveld wrote that Rommel had been advised by the German and Italian staffs that his army could not properly be supplied so far from the ports of Tripoli and Benghazi. Rommel pressed ahead with his advance to Alamein and as predicted, supply difficulties limited the attacking potential of the Axis forces. According to Maurice Remy, 2002, Hitler and Mussolini put pressure on Rommel to advance. Rommel had been very pessimistic, especially after the First Battle of El Alamein, and knew that as U.S. supplies were en route to Africa and Axis ships were being sunk in the Mediterranean, the Axis was losing a race against time. 
On 27 August, Kesselring promised Rommel that supplies would arrive in time but Westphal pointed out that such an expectation would be unrealistic and the offensive should not begin until they had arrived. After a conversation with Kesselring on 30 August, Rommel decided to attack the hardest decision in my life. Topic: <laughs> Casualties. In 2005, Neil Barr wrote that the 36,939 Panzerarmee casualties was an estimate because of the chaos of the Axis retreat. British figures, based on ultra intercepts, gave German casualties as 1,149 killed, 3,886 wounded, and 8,050 men captured. Italian losses were 971 dead, 933 wounded, and 15,552 men captured. By the 11th of November, the number of Axis prisoners had risen to 30,000 men. In a note to the Rommel papers, Fritz Bayerlein, quoting figures obtained from Offiziele Bericht des Oberkommandos Afrika, instead estimated German losses in the battle as 1,100 killed, 3,900 wounded, and 7,900 prisoners, and Italian losses as 1,200 killed, 1,600 wounded, and 20,000 prisoners. According to the Italian official history, Axis losses during the battle were 4,000 to 5,000 killed or missing. 7,000 to 8,000 wounded and 17,000 prisoners. During the retreat, the losses rose to 9,000 killed or missing, 15,000 wounded, and 35,000 prisoners. According to General Giuseppe Rizzo, total Axis casualties included 25,000 men killed or wounded, including 5,920 Italians killed and 30,000 prisoners, 20,000 Italians and 10,724 Germans, 510 tanks and 2,000 field guns, anti-tank guns, anti-aircraft guns. Axis tank losses were c. 500. On the 4th of November, only 36 German tanks were left out of the 249 at the beginning of the battle. About half of the 278 Italian tanks had been lost, and most of the remainder were knocked out on the next day by the 7th Armored Division. About 254 Axis guns were lost, along with 64 German and 20 Italian aircraft. The 8th Army had 13,560 casualties, of whom 2,350 men had been killed, 8,950 wounded, and 2,260 were missing. 58% of the casualties were British, 22% Australian, 10% New Zealanders, 6% South African, 1% Indian, and 3 percent Allied forces. The 8th Army lost from 332 to 500 tanks, although by the end of the battle, 300 had been repaired. The artillery lost 111 guns and the DAV lost 77 British and 20 American aircraft. <laughs> <laughs> Subsequent operations The 8th Army was surprised by the Axis withdrawal and confusion caused by redeployments between the three corps meant they were slow in pursuit, failing to cut off Rommel at Fouca and Mercer Matru. The Desert Air Force failed to make a maximum effort to bomb a disorganized and retreating opponent, which on 5 November was within range and confined to the coast road. Supply shortages and a belief that the Luftwaffe were about to get strong reinforcements, led the DAV to be cautious, reduce the number of offensive sorties on 5 November and protect the 8th Army. <laughs> <laughs> Battle of El Aquila The Axis made a fighting withdrawal to El Aquila but the Axis troops were exhausted and had received few replacements, while Montgomery had planned to transport material over great distances, to provide the 8th Army with 2,400 t of supplies per day. Huge quantities of engineer stores had been collected to repair the coast road, the railway line from El Alamein to Fort Capuzzo, despite having been blown up in over 200 places, was quickly repaired. 
In the month after 8th Army reached Capuzzo, the railway carried 133,000 short tons of supplies. Benghazi handled 3,000 short tons a day by the end of December, rather than the expected 800 short tons .Montgomery paused for three weeks to concentrate his forces and prepare an assault on El Aquila to deny the Axis the possibility of a counterattack. On the 11th of December, Montgomery launched the 51st Highland Division along the line of the coast road with the 7th Armoured Division on the inland flank. On the 12th of December, the 2nd New Zealand Division started a deeper flanking maneuver to cut the Axis line of retreat on the coast road in the rear of the Mercer Brega position. The Highland Division made a slow and costly advance and 7th Armoured Division met stiff resistance from the Ariete Combat Group the remains of the Ariete Armoured Division. The Panzerarme had lost roughly 75,000 men, 1,000 guns and 500 tanks since the Second Battle of Alamein and withdrew. By 15 December, the New Zealanders had reached the coast road but the firm terrain allowed Rommel to break his forces into smaller units and withdraw cross-country through the gaps between the New Zealand positions. Rommel conducted a textbook retreat, destroying all equipment and infrastructure left behind and peppering the land behind him with mines and booby traps. The 8th Army reached Sirte on 25 December but west of the port, were forced to pause to consolidate their strung-out formations and to prepare an attack at Wadi Zemzem, near Buarat 230 miles 370 km east of Tripoli. Rommel had, with the agreement of Field Marshal Bastico, sent a request to the Italian Commando Supremo in Rome to withdraw to Tunisia where the terrain would better suit a defensive action and where he could link with the Axis army forming there, in response to the Operation Torch landings. Mussolini replied on 19 December that the Panzerarme must resist to the last man at Buarat. Tripoli On 15 January 1943, the 51st Highland Division made a frontal attack while the 2nd New Zealand Division and the 7th Armoured Division drove around the inland flank of the Axis Line. Weakened by the withdrawal of 21st Panzer Division to Tunisia to strengthen the 5th Panzer Army Hans-Jürgen von Arnhem, Rommel conducted a fighting retreat. The port of Tripoli, 150 miles (240 kilometers) further west, was taken on the 23rd of January as Rommel continued to withdraw to the Maret Line, the French southern defensive position in Tunisia. Topic: <laughs> Tunisia. Rommel was by this time in contact with the 5th Panzer Army, which had been fighting against the multinational 1st Army in northern Tunisia, since shortly after Operation Torch. Hitler was determined to retain Tunisia and Rommel finally started to receive replacement men and materials. The Axis faced a war on two fronts, with the 8th Army approaching from the east and the British, French and Americans from the west. The German-Italian Panzer Army was renamed the Italian First Army General Giovanni Messa and Rommel assumed command of the new army group Africa, responsible for both fronts. The two Allied armies were commanded by the 18th Army Group General Harold Alexander. The failure of the First Army in the run for Tunis in December 1942 led to a longer North African campaign which ended when the Italian-German forces in North Africa capitulated in May 1943. See also El Alamein Fountain War Memorial commemorating the battle, in Sydney, Australia List of World War II battles North African Campaign Timeline Dan Pienaar Topic Notes equals equals footnotes <laughs>